everyone. This is for episode 106, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, I am in Los Angeles at the moment. Zachary but Abel is still here from Indiana. This is why you can tell that we're related because you're Dreaming. the same. Oh, I always do that. It's, also bit, uh, it's hard to know when we're on. Anyway, we're on now. Um, I'm so excited for this week because we have the most amazing people on. Uh, Paul Spashevsky wrote this episode, co-executive produced the season right up until the end of season four. Um, and just, oh, I can't wait to get into this because you were just so pivotal to all the plot lines and story arcs and the stories that would come out of the writer's room about you were just, oh no. Of course you're an amazing writer. Like, oh amazing. no. Brilliant episode. But you were also so incredible at breaking story. That's what all the writers would say, that you were so good at weaving the plots together. And 22 episodes is a lot of plot to try to kind of weave together and figure out, you know, mid-season finale and when you reveal stuff and how long it takes, all that stuff. So I'm um, thank you for being here. I know that maybe you don't, you know, love... <laughs> Love these they're all things. liars. I mean, you know them by now, right? They're all they're all lying. We had an amazing writing staff. And Jeff, Jed, and Mo drove the bus, and they were fantastic. And I was happy to be part of the gang. That's that's what it is. Well, you are for sure one of the leaders of the pack. We're so lucky to have you for so long. Um, and then Vincent Missiano, yes. director of this episode, and um. Oh my gosh, I looked up 11 episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yep. I got lucky. I got a good one to start. And this was your you first? You and me both, pal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was the first. Wow. And then, Paul, it was your first. We missed it. Yeah. Was yeah. We, um, you know, it's interesting. When S.H.I.E.L.D. was ordered, it was a pilot and seven scripts. And so... Um, I got a call from my dear friend, Jeff Bell, uh, the most underrated, amazing showrunner on the planet who never gets the credit he deserves. Um, and we had worked previously together on a little show called Daybreak. And he was like, I got some, I, I, I have to like break some stories. Do you want to come play? It's a Marvel show. And I was like, done, like I'm there. Um, came in and interviewed with uh, Jeff and Jed and Mo and Joss and Jeff Loeb, which was pretty intimidating. Um, and, you know, they were stupid enough to hire me. And this story for this episode kind of came out of those first initial pod of stories that we were thinking about. And, um, and then I had to go away to produce a pilot that I was contracted to do. And then I came back, but I was sort of in the, you know, in the ether when they were all still like prepping the pilot and, and there was a script, but it was still in the casting stage. And so I got to see, you know, your, your tremendous um, audition with Ian, which was again, the, the sort of the genesis of the heart of this episode. So I kind of stole from Jed and Mo on that one. And I have apologized to them profusely for doing that, but um, they were kind enough to sort of lend that heart uh, into this episode. I just, like I said, I got lucky on the draw. It was like, oh, I get to write that one. Awesome. That's so cool that you were there from the, cause that makes so much sense. Cause like my audition scenes, were like little scenes from this episode yeah. mixed together, like you say, and then one from the end, the, the finale of season yep. one. That's really interesting that when uh, they bring a team together to kind of create this Marvel pilot that you were also, like it was a bigger team that helped to bring, like what would, what would the starting eight episodes look like? Um, that's so, it, so when was that? Um. I want to say it was the fall of 2012. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and like I said, I was um, I was currently writing a, a pilot for another unnamed network, and um, and so they I, I kind of came in as a, sort of a day player for a little while until, uh, and I didn't think that pilot was ever going to go, and so I thought, oh, well, I'm here to stay, and then I got a call, and they're like, no, we're going to shoot that pilot at the, uh, you know. And I was like, oh no, I have to leave all these wonderful people. Oh. Um, 
because I mean, again, I can't say enough about the people who ran this show, Jeff Bell, uh, Jed and Marissa, they, um, they're, they're, they're the most talented, wonderful folks um, I've had the pleasure of working with in a writer's room. And they, they are every bit as good human beings as they are writers. And just to be uh, included in that group, um, I normally don't hang out on a show for four years. I get, I get restless. I, I tend to start going like, how do you reinvent the wheel after doing 88 episodes or whatever? And um, it was, it was, uh, it was a terrific run. I just love being around them. So uh, very fortunate, very fortunate and all thanks to them. Well, we were so thankful to have you. I mean, you just, you were in the DNA of the show and we definitely, there was a big palsy shaped hole when you left, but um, onto other things. Hey, yes. should we press play? Cause I feel like I could just talk a little bit. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if, Zach, are you watching this or you? Zach's monitoring the chat, so you might have yes. enough screen going. And pe people are asking why we're in separate screens, so we're not in the same place. We've, uh, out. We've had a huge argument. I just don't want to be in the same room. You're next to her. <laughs> no, I'm in Los Angeles at the moment. I have flown to LA. Uh, we're, we're going through the life changes of packing up the apartment and then onto different different places. So yeah, for now I am in LA and Zachary is in Indiana still. But yeah. of all the things I took, I only took hand luggage from Indy to here, but this made it, thank God. <laughs> it's just took up my whole suitcase. It's, it's a heavy- It suits you, both of you. You look fabulous. <laughs> thank you. Okay, let's press play. Okay. Um, like, do you do a three, two, one countdown? Like, I'm yeah. on, the, I'm on the Marvel flip right now. So tell okay, me. Okay, so I'm on Netflix, which I'll tell you when I get to the Marvel flip because mine's okay. got like an ABC thing. Are you? How are you watching it, Vince? Are you on Netflix or are uh, you? I, I have the. Uh, I actually bought it on iTunes, so uh, oh, I've paid yeah. yourself. I it so I've got oh, it from God. the flip as well. Oh my God! Okay, I'm going to start my. So if you're watching on Netflix, I'm going to start on one, three. Two, one. Okay, I'm really loud. Vince, I love that you bought it. Okay, now I'm on the flip. Go, play. Yes, no one exactly. <laughs> well, every week I managed to um, yeah, test up slightly in a different way. Um, so Vince, how did you, and feel free to jump in as we watch it to say different stuff because I'm just so nosy and there's so much I want to know, but feel free to, um, interrupt me if there's something going on the screen that you want to um, shout out. But how did you, so this was your first episode for us and then you clearly did an amazing job because you stuck around for a long time. We kept bringing you back and you were a, definitely a favorite director. And this was the time that I think we all fell in love with you on this episode. But how did you, how did this come about that you directed this one? I came to the show uh, through the line producer, through Gary Brown. Gary and I had worked on, on a series called, called Prison Break uh, before, and he put me in the roster. But I knew I was in a sort of a different place the day that I showed up at Culver, and the production office door was locked. And I, I, I thought I was in the wrong place, and I knocked on the door, and a very burly man uh, in a suit very sternly said, who are you? And I said, I must be in the wrong place. I'm here to direct an episode of a show uh, called Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. He said, no, this is the right place. And he opened his lapel of his coat and it said, uh, Marvel Global Security. And I knew I was not in a normal place at that point. So uh, I got very lucky. And I got very lucky with the uh, landing on this particular episode uh, because this is one of those episodes I think, Paul, you, you, you did this on purpose and you knew this, that this is one of those episodes that changes the nature of the show, that expands the emotional vocabulary and the character reach in the show, and yep. in my mind, the ambition of the show. And uh, I was lucky that I was the one who got to, who landed on this, this base. Um, I think I was the one that was lucky, Vince, because um, we, we handed you some incredibly challenging sequences and and elements, you know, the show is always a challenge to do the the stunts and the visual effects, the special effects. Uh, but when 
you know, you, you have these emotional scenes with a number of different characters, you need a director who's going to come in and, and really sort of get to the heart of the emotion of those scenes and work with the actors uh, in a collaborative way to get the best performances. And I, I just thought, Vince, you were spectacular with all of the actors. I mean, Elizabeth can speak to that. I thought the performance you got from Elizabeth and Ian in particular in this episode uh, was phenomenal. Um, it's not often I get to sit in the village um, and just kind of, when I say village, I mean, little video village where we watch the show, you know, as the actors are doing their thing. And I get to watch Vince, you know, the maestro kind of work. And, um, and, and it's like, oh, I'm, I can't wait to see what, you know, he got uh, in those conversations with Ian and Elizabeth. And then the cameras roll and you feel the emotion right through the screen. And that was all you, I mean, Elizabeth, like uh, there are a couple of scenes that are, I think my favorite of the series um, in this episode and Vince, you know, you knocked it out of the park. I, it, was a, it was a joy working with you throughout the okay. entire process. It, it, the same to you, but it, it, the, the truth of the matter is, and we're all we're all congratulating each other. But Ian and Elizabeth uh, were, and, and I don't think any of the others will will, it, will have their feelings hurt if I say they were my special favorites because this was the place I landed, uh, and I spent we spent so much important time together. And they, you know, I'm happy to take credit for everything they did, but <laughs> they did it, uh, and uh, it, it was just charming. You know, Ian created a, 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 a unique character. This is a character that, you know, there aren't very many of these. This is Jacques Tati, this is uh, uh, Fernandel, this is all these sort of Charlie Chaplin, there's so these interesting characters. But to go from high comedy to high drama yeah. uh, and for Elizabeth to be so emotionally available on every, in every scene is extraordinary. So I'm, I'm, I couldn't be prouder uh, of the work that they did and of the work that uh, the whole company did. It was a nice, I was glad I got to come back 11 times. Yes, thank God, we needed you more. It felt for me like such a turning point in, as you're saying, for, I guess for the show as a whole, but you know, up until this point, Fitzsimmons had been the comedic relief that we come in and say, you know, do a little science and then go out again. All of a sudden we had, real uh you know we were like the the storyline of the episode the a storyline which we hadn't been up until this point and it felt like after we'd done this episode and we i think i just i mean ever since then i felt so close to you for and you vince and i feel like you know you share something on set when you get to do scenes like this that's a that's a bond um but i also felt like okay if i if I get that tap on my shoulder to say, oh, thank you so much for the time, but um, we're, we're done now. I just felt, uh, I just felt at peace. I felt accomplished in that. Okay, what an amazing episode for the, and I was number six in the regulars. Like I was the, the bottom of the regulars, you know? So I never signed on to the show thinking that I would ever be a storyline. Mm -hmm. So to be able to get to do that, I was, I was okay, I'm ready to peace out now. And it was just so fun and interesting you say Vince about the security being so high because it was and I think for us for me that just felt normal because this was really the only tv show I'd done um but you had such a calm presence on set yeah that, that did you feel the pressure did you feel the pressure of it being a marvel show and everything being super secretive um I, I, I was, I, I got instructed about what it was. Uh, it, it, this, this wasn't the peak of that for me. Later when we did that tie-in, I think it was that season with uh, the Avengers film and yeah. suddenly the scripts where everything was being, we were getting scripts on cherry colored pages so they could not be Xerox copied. Right. And, uh, you couldn't actually read them in the dark stage. Uh, then I knew how outside the norm uh, the series was going to be in terms of uh, those kinds of protections, copyright issues and stuff. Uh, but, you know, look, the, the, the show, it, it's interesting what you're saying, because for me, the, what I noticed about you and more, even more so about Ian was I wasn't sure that Ian expected to be away from home quite so long. No, I think and, you're right. Yeah. And it was really landing on him. He was under a lot of stress in this moment. Uh, uh, feeling very confused about 
what he was doing and what the choices were. And this became a, a sort of a, a life raft that suddenly he saw the, the quality of the work that was being done and the importance of his place in it. And I think he was able to, uh, to really bite down hard and, uh, uh, and take it over. Yeah, because you don't, when you're an actor on a show like this, and maybe the same for the writers in a way, but you really, you know, you get the scripts episode to episode and you, you're aware that the writers are able to write to your strengths and away from your weaknesses. And so there's a real, and nobody necessarily, like we didn't know where our characters were going. We didn't know um, kind of uh, if, we just didn't, we just were sort of acting in a bit of a floaty situation. And sometimes it felt like you, I think what I'm trying to say is I totally agree, Vince, and that this episode was like this flag in the ground for Fitzsimmons of, okay, this is where we, this is our jumping off point now that we've kind of, and as characters molded, and I, I forgot how much was in this episode because I, yeah. I think this episode is like, ow, it's the one Simmons gets the virus naturally for so much. There's so Other much it was tricky because, again, that first season, as you know, was so challenging for so many reasons. There were a lot of people involved. There were a lot of eyes on it. There was a lot of attention. And I think Jeff Bell has has spoken in public about sort of the Venn diagram of like what Mar wanted, what, the, you know, and and like the stories we were allowed to tell were like this tiny little sliver in the middle. Yeah. And that whole challenge of like, well, are we telling procedural open and closed stories? Or are we doing serialization and tonally? Are we like wacky and funny or are we darker? And everybody wanted something different on the outside. We as writers were like, if they would just, you know, let us make the show we want to make and we could give them an example, then maybe, you know, it would be good. And, um, and, you know, there was a lot of wrestling and a lot of notes calls and a lot of back and forth. And, you know, right around this time, around episode six or so, when we handed in five scripts, I think there was a little less, um, you know, overseer of it all. It was still very heavy handed in terms of what we could and couldn't do and what we could and couldn't say. Um, but but I, I think, you know, we always had it in our back pocket, the, the talent you know, level, your, your, your talent, Ian's talent. We knew what everyone could do because we, we'd seen everyone do their thing. And we were always just holding back going like, wait until they see when we can show everyone, you know, that, you know, that level of talent. And, and it's always also tricky when you're, a, if you're doing procedural open and closed stories, your job is to make the audience invest in that case of the week and those people who are the victims as opposed to investing in your lead characters. And that's where serialization, you, you give your main characters those arcs and you want people to feel for your main characters and putting a main character in jeopardy the way we did with, with you and Ian, with Fitz and Simmons in episode six was like, oh, they're doing that already? They're gonna, oh, somebody on the, on the bus is in jeopardy. Like, well, you want the audience to, to feel for you guys and, and, and so to get away from just the case of the week thing, you know, we, we obviously did a little bit of that. I mean, we gave you this terrific scene with Clark and, and, and Vince Loresco who played the firefighter coming up, not to spoil it. Um, but, you know, there, you know we, we tried to have our cake and eat it too with procedural sort of stories and serialized stories. And this was, you know, when we just started to open that door and we were allowed to open that door a little bit. Yeah, and I felt questions changing from around this time of this episode airing of less about uh, what superheroes are we gonna see from the Marvel Universe and more, hey, tell us about your relationship with Fitz and is it, are you guys gonna get together or you know, it, it, like the questions definitely started changing. And that's really interesting as a writer, you have to approach it and go, okay, we need a kind of a, a story of the week, but also these are our characters and then as a director coming in, are you told Vince of like, this is kind of what we're trying to do with this episode. Can you direct it in a way that helps us to focus more on maybe the main cast rather than the guest or the, like, do you get that brief or? You know, I, 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 I there were moments later in later seasons where there was talk about the larger arc and I was, uh, allowed to take a peek behind the curtain. 
at this point, I was worried about this script and it was, as we're saying, quite dense. And I don't know, uh, without loving the work that had preceded it, it wasn't the same as the episodes that, that had preceded it. So there wasn't a lot, I mean, stylistically, the, 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 the photography, the crew were wonderful. Uh, the show had a strong look, but, the, but thematically, this was a somewhat different tone. Uh, and uh, I just stayed close to Paul and, you know, and the script and tried to fight for the things that I, I think he wanted. I asked if he wanted, and there were places where um, if something wasn't happening, uh, I fought to get what Paul had written, um, you know, and that's, uh, uh, that's, that was it. I wasn't, I wasn't part of the Marvel universe, uh, so to speak, at that point, and, and looking into the distance. Now, v Vince was a fantastic collaborator the entire time. I mean, you know, we, we tried to nurture the relationships between the writers and the directors of those episodes. And, and, you know, if you're a writer and you're a producer, you should earn that title and be on set and learn how hard a director's job is. And, and, and you try to stay out of a director's way. And I tried to stay out of Vince's way because he obviously knew what he was doing. And his hands were so full all the time. I, I brought a prop uh, just to show you. you uh, I went back in time. And I printed the call sheet of day one. Okay, I'm just gonna a little peek at that. 10:30 a.m. Ragtag, and on that call sheet there are seven strips. And when I say seven strips, there were seven scenes that Vince had to do day one, and half of those scenes had three and four people in them. And for those of you uninitiated uh, who who don't know what it's like to try to you know shoot a scene like you're doing it over and over again from multiple angles with coverage on all the actors and you have two cameras. Occasionally you have three, we had mm -hmm. two. And we handed Vince this call sheet that honestly is two days worth of work and go, you got 12 hours, Vince. Yeah. And he, you know, he put on his jazz music on, yes! you know, in the village <laughs> that was nice and chill, got everybody chilled. He was like, okay, we can do this. And he spoke to you guys and I was like, holy shit, how's he gonna get this day one? Right into the fire. And he nailed it like a champion. Like a champion. That's a split. What what day of the week was that? Were we 10:30? Because it was later in the week. It was 10:30. It was a Thursday. Uh Thursday. Let's see. Sorry, my eyes are going bad. Thursday, September 12th, 2013. Crew call was at 10:30. Yep. And oh, um after my birthday, Vince. Oh. Oh, a new year. Start to Vince. That's a so tough the thing. The, the the I've had real jobs in my life. I was a high school English teacher when I got out of college for four years. I had another job after that for four years. When I got an opportunity to get into the, this business, uh, I considered it a gift. And uh, you know, in terms of getting tense on a set, my motto has always been, if no children, old people or animals get hurt. What's the problem? We'll take care of it. It's gonna be okay. Just relax, we'll get through this. And uh, so that's, that, that, that's the way it always felt on this set. Everybody was always, the thing about this was everybody was always pulling in the same direction. I never felt that there were people who uh, uh, didn't take the work seriously or had their mind somewhere else. Everybody came to play, you know, so, and did this weird balance uh, that Paul wrote and that they acted of sort of comic moments and, some, and, and moments that didn't leave out a full family. The, the children could watch the show, you know, adults could watch the show. That's hard to do. Uh, yeah. People don't recognize in this, in this, uh, in the age of uh, streaming services, the Netflix shows and the others, that they're they're narrow casting. They're they're targeting a a rather refined narrow band of humanity. Whereas this show was able to really reach broad and 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 attract a lot of different people uh, and keep it all interesting. So yeah, that's it. That is. Could, could you guys each go over? You talked about how you came to the show. Can you talk about how, like Vince, you just talked about how the jobs you did prior to entertainment. Could you mm. talk about how your, your background and how you became what you are now? Because there's some questions about that. Um, well, my story is far too complex for this venue, uh, but I was a high school English teacher uh, and uh, uh, thought I was a storyteller. Uh, my brother, my, my younger brother, Chris, who's also now a director, uh, had uh, and I 
uh, wrote uh, some things with his best friend, Jerry Seinfeld. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, from, they, were high school, they were high school classmates. And the first film I ever wrote and short that we shot starred Jerry. Uh, and uh, we were able, my brother and I were, became grips. And I worked as a prop man. That was our entry into the film business. And uh, within about two years from the time I started as a PA, um, I got my opportunity to direct a uh, commercial uh, starring Frank Sinatra, as it, as it happens. Oh, you're um, kidding! Oh, uh, no, you know, luck is more important. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, my brother had become a director of photography and a camera operator and was asked to work on the series Law & Order. From there, he became a, a producing director at ER, then later at West Wing. And I got my first opportunity at Law & Order and di have directed 45 different series at this point. Oh and, uh, oh, wow. you know, but it's, it's better to be lucky than smart, you know, for the two of us to have ended up in, in a family completely unrelated to this kind of work and to this profession. My mother always thought you do creative things as a hobby yeah. uh, and you find a job to pay the rent. Hmm. And the fact that we found some place where we could go and our hobby became the way to pay the rent uh, is marvelous. Oh, what an amazing story. And I love that about a huge reason of why I wanted to do these watch alongs is because there is no one way of working in this no. industry, regardless of what your role is. And it's so amazing to know, you know, because there are, I get questions all the time. How do you, how do I be a director? How do I write? How do I do all this stuff? And you, it's hard to say, ah, you just put one foot in front of the other, but hearing stories like that is just, and that's a lot of hard work, being a grip, being a, working in props. It's, you know, if it's, you, if it's not exactly what you want to do, there are long hours you're putting in for a job that you don't dream of. Do you're doing it so that you have the opportunity at some point to do that thing that you really want to do. That's, you know, it's not an overnight success. It takes Listen, it's, it's, it's all part of your preparation. You know, I, I, my, my proudest credit on IMDb is I was a, a grip on the Bruce Springsteen Dancing in the Dark video. Wow. With Brian De Palma directing. You know, uh, I, I worked on Ju on Julian Leno's rock videos with Sam Peckinpah directing, um, you know, so oh. you learn something from every place you go for good or for ill, um, yeah. you know, so. But not everybody does, Vince. You're you're selling yourself short with the better lucky than good comment because you're, yeah. you're very, very good at your craft. And I don't care how good of an artist you are, if you have the most beautiful eye or whatever. It's so much of it is the craftsmanship. It is the hard work. It is the, you know, the, the paying attention to those directors that, you know, and absorbing things and then altering stuff to your taste. Like, you know, you, you have that thing and, um, and, and don't sell yourself short. It was a, it was a joy working with you because I knew you had that level of experience and I loved watching you work because I learned from watching you work. So that's, yeah, it's, and the respect for the crew. You know what it is for a crew to put in 12 hours of work. And especially grips, you're carrying so much heavy equipment, moving the lighting wow. around. You know, for a director to come in that has walked in their shoes, mm -hmm. you instantly have the respect of the crew and you then appreciate their time and appreciate the hustle. And, you know, when you have a call time on day one of 10.30 as a director, you perhaps walk in and go, wow, they had a late night last night. And I'm coming, and it's my first. It's my day one on a Thursday, so a crew is kind of tired. We have seven scenes to get through. I know what this, you know, as a crew member, for a director to come in and understand their journey to get to Thursday, yep. it's huge, and that it's just such an important part of directing. I think that empathy for how so the hard best it. word. Of, the best word of advice would be that uh, if you show up Thursday at ten thirty, and they've been working until two in the morning the night before. Uh, it's best not to appear too uh, enthusiastic uh, <laughs> and to remember that sometimes in order to speed up, you have to slow down and you have to prioritize. Um, that's the, that's the, the, the heart of it. Nobody wants you. Oh, I'm looking at this scene where you and Ian are sitting back to back. Oh. Is it there? Are you there? Yeah, yeah. I'm not, uh... Oh, I'm not there yet. <laughs> oh, All right, I'm gonna slow down. Let me know when you get there because that's this scene was so pivotal for us. I don't know if you remember it the way that I do. I, this, I 
remember it because there were so many. I remember it more because a lot of uh, like pictures of Fitzsimmons, I still sign of this scene of them sitting in that position. Yeah. So I, I mean, but um, why does it stick out to you, Vince? Well, it it it, it was th this was where the characters found one another. I, I really think this was the scene. Uh, not just in terms of the the story of the episode, but also on the set, the two of you working. I don't think you had done a scene like this uh, before uh, in the in the series. Am I wrong, Paul? No, and and again, I have to give credit to Jed and Marissa because the inspiration for these scenes was taken from the scene that they wrote for Elizabeth and Ian's audition together and we all watched it. We were like, wow, there's some magic there. There's chemistry there and they can get emotional about each other and look at that. And, you know, the scene was sort of, it took place in a box and, you know, something terrible happens and, oh, are we going to live or die? And we sort of went, well, what if we did that as a story and how do we, you know, how do we concoct that story and, and you know, make it more of, you know, an arc as opposed to a single scene and, and sort of that was the, the genesis of that. So I credit, uh, you know, Jed and Mo, uh, terrific writers. And, and also I, I have to give credit to um, a couple other writers who helped break this episode, uh, Lauren LaFranc and Rafe Judkins, who um, while Brent Fletcher and Monica and Shalisha uh, were, were in the other room breaking uh, episode, I wanna say eight, um, you know, we were breaking this episode and Rafe and Lauren had a lot to do with a lot of the fun you see in this episode, you know, no, my name is on the script, but you know, the writer's room is, it is a collaborative effort getting these, you know, scenes done as a collaborative effort. I can, I can pick out lines that Jed pitched. I can pick out moments that Jeff Bell went, well, what if you did that? And I went, oh, I didn't know we could do that on this show. And he's like, I think we can uh, there, you know, it is, it's a team effort. It, no, no one person uh, on a 22 episode show can generate that much story and come up with every storyline and every, you know, every plot and every line of dialogue. So um, kudos to, to the writers. I feel like I, I benefited greatly from a collective uh, genius and wisdom from the folks that I worked with. Well, I'm going, yeah, okay, I'll try that idea rather than thinking, well, it's my name that's going to be on that script. So if this doesn't work, no one's going to know it was your terrible idea and just go, yeah, I'm going to, I'll, I'll audition it in my script and see what it's like. And I think- well, we we had a rule. It was like, you couldn't just kill other people's pitches. It's like, you weren't allowed to say no. Like you, you had to, we had a phrase. It was let it suck for a minute, you know, because something that's just awful is just, you know, a one tweak away from potentially being really fantastic. You just have to kind of work it a little bit. And so everybody came in with that attitude and, um, and pitched their hearts out and, and we tried stuff and some of it didn't work. Um, but but some of it did, and that was because everyone was open. And again, it helps when you have good people along with good writers. You know, we were all, uh, I think, on the same page as as people. And um, and I miss that room. It was a fantastic, fantastic room filled with terrifically talented, really funny, uh, great writers. I mean, I laughed every day, every oh, day. Alone. Everybody says that too of the writers' room being so special and what an amazing what amazing words to live by like let an idea suck for a second and then see where the goodness is especially when you guys were under so much pressure from this for this season in particular there's nothing that kills creativity like pressure from suits you know it's it that's a wonderful brave attitude to have and clearly it's like yeah no and by the way that was really hard because i was known as like the bitter guy in the room like <laughs> I, you know, um, so, so to, for, for them to give me an optimistic, positive attitude, uh, is saying something. <laughs> this, is, this is a question from me, but all of you just did, I mean, Lil, obviously you're in the whole series, but you all worked on it so much from like the beginning, beginning, as you worked on it, how did it change? Like how, how did the series evolve in your eyes and working on it and everything? How did that go from that beginning sort of, I mean, it's this huge Marvel, all the pressure and then progress. I think, um, 
I mean, I don't know, but you know, I feel like, and Vince, you can speak to this as well. We had a, a tonal sort of shift um, after the big Captain America moment um, in season one, when we could finally say the word Hydra, when we could have bad spies, when we could, when we could, you know, mine some other places, but we also grew our characters up a little bit, I think, and, and, um, and gave them, gave them genuine arcs at the beginning of every season. If, if, you know, um, Simmons is starting here in episode one of season three, where she wind up. And we did that for all the characters across the board. And, you know, you have to have directors who are sort of aware of all of that so that when they step in, they understand all the baggage that comes with it when, when you're doing a serialized episode. And that's where, you know, Vince came back 11 times. Like it, he had a shorthand, he knew the show, he was great with the show. And Vince, I don't know if you felt a, a sea change or a shift as the seasons went on or even that first season. There's no, there's no question. And I, I was lucky enough to do the episode that followed uh, the uh, Avengers tie-in. Mm. And uh, when uh, Brett's character suddenly turned into, you know, suddenly changed sides, changed horses. Yep. Uh, and uh, what happened for, what, what I saw was that suddenly this whole area of darkness was permitted. Mm -hmm. That the show could get darker, richer, uh, more grown up, more exploratory. Uh, it could start to do some of the things that science fiction and does best, which is to explore social issues that you can't really talk about uh, in real life uh, in any depth. So you 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 do the other. Uh, you, uh, uh, you 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 take them a generation away from reality. No, the, the show the show changed a lot. And just again, as I'm watching this and seeing all these couplets, all these pairings uh, of people as they're negotiating between themselves, each one of those relationships got richer in this mm -hmm. episode. Not just. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Fitz uh, and uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, yes. uh, the Fitz Simmons. Yeah. Each relationship got 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 tighter and, and closer uh, yeah. and more organic. Uh, not to jump ahead, but the scenes that are coming up, uh, the way this show ends with a series yeah. of couplets is yeah. brilliant and opens up a lot of doors that then everybody got free reign to go go down those roads, knowing that the characters were now established and their relationships were established. Yeah. So Vince, I've, I've been asked a million times um, and I'm getting yelled at for not asking you, over the 11, was there one that stands out to you as like, this is your favorite or? Um, no, that's that's really hard. Uh, 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 you know, there, there, there were some that you, you remember better. This is one of the ones I remember best. But I also remember, um, Oh, you're going to have to forgive me. Uh, uh, the, the the episode that I did where uh, Elizabeth's character and Ian's character uh, are uh, uh, escaped from the planet named... Oh, Mavis. 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 Yeah. Was it Mavis? Mavis, Mavis was <laughs> my... Was, was we, an said it wrong. <laughs> and uh, Mavis was... That was a, a fast... That really went dark. Uh, that was when you saw everybody's darkest side. Uh, and, and Brett's character made yet another turn. Uh, and uh, it was sort of remarkable in that way. So, uh, and just visually, that was the most interesting uh, show to work on, episode to work on. Uh, yeah, because this one is set obviously so much on the plane, which is difficult because we've seen this lab a bunch of times now. And I loved, you know, now that Fitz is in the lab and everybody else is on the outside, just the kind of, the way you shot this Vince and it really, you really um, encapsulated Simmons being isolated and in the lab and then everybody, you know, shot through the windows to make it feel like, you know, she was so far away from them. And as an actor, it's uh, an interesting way to act a scene through glass when, you know, usually every, you want to get everything from the other person. Um, and I just loved, I, I felt like this was such a confident way to direct because you are not getting the super tight close-ups of Agent Coulson, Clark Gregg, that at this point, that's why everybody was tuning in in a way, you know, and you, instead you shot him through, uh, through the door, through the staircase with, you know, like Agent Ward in the foreground too, and it was just a cool kind of 
you shot it as this is a team and this is something they are collectively going through. And I was, I watched it again this afternoon and it just struck me of that was so, there's so much foresight in this episode, writing it and directing it of, we're making this about these, these agents, these people that, gosh dang it, you're gonna come to love them and you're gonna care about them. Mm -hmm. It was a cool, and now just like talking to Colson through the glass and this, when you mentioned about Mo and Jed, Paul, yeah, they, uh, you know, Marissa is a lupus warrior and survivor and fighter. Yes. And uh, she said to me, and she said this before, there were times when her and Jed would be separated through a glass wall just like this because she had to be isolated because she was under yep. a lupus attack. And, um, you know, how that, how, oh, I'm just getting goose pimples thinking about that conversation with her because she was saying to me, you know, that's the most excruciating thing to talk to the love of your life or the people that you love and not be able to touch them, to, to have this partition um, that made it an even more kind of sensitive, uh, amazing gift for me to have as an actor, but also there's a bit of pressure there with your boss saying, hey, this oh, yeah. really happened to us. And then to have people like you and someone like Vince in that little pod with me to go, this is how we're gonna do it. This is, you know, we have time. Yes, we have six other scenes to do today, but we have time to do this one. And, um, you know, I'm so glad that, I'm so glad we got it right, you know, because there was so much, there's a legacy to a lot of those scenes that- Oh yeah. No, and, and uh, you know, credit goes to, to Vince and obviously to you, you were the one doing it. For That's one of my favorite moments of all sort of the, the run that I was in uh, on the show is you uh, bending but not breaking in that moment, showing, like you're on the verge of tears, obviously, but when you tell Colson that, you know, tell my father first and but that, uh, it was heartbreaking, that scene and the way you played it, uh, the strength and power uh, in that moment. And yet clearly you're devastated. Uh, the reserved way you did that scene. Um, it's one of my favorite moments in the show. And again, that's, you know, all credit to, to you and for Vince, you know, playing that quietly, giving that scene time, giving those moments time. Um, it was really moving. I mean, that's, again, one of those moments where you're sitting in the village and you're trying not to cry yourself because uh, it's just, those moments are real. Those are, those are real conversations that people have to have, unfortunately, especially, you know, today in the situation we're in. Um, yeah, this, this episode certainly hits home in a different way now, talking about, you know, a virus and <laughs> what that's, the realities of that. Do you remember that, mo well, you probably won't, Vince, but I remember that moment so clearly when, just because of all the episodes of television that you've directed, but you um, doing that moment talking to Colson about my dad uh, and you kept saying to me don't like hold it back as much as you can hold it back and I remember saying I'm really trying but I just you know once I find it hard Zach knows like I do this in real life too once I get to that point of emotion it is I find it almost impossible to shut it off and and um and it wasn't that I didn't trust you I was really trying to hold it back because and at the filming of the scene, uh, my dad was going through a lot of health issues and was sick and I was very far away from him. And just talking about my mom and dad, I was like, oh, oh God, okay, okay. And I remember someone saying, you know, do you need a minute? And I was like, no, we need to go now before I start feeling this too much because, and, mm -hmm. and you were so right, Vince. And I think as an actor, you, you wanna cry and you wanna show people you can cry. You know, the ego wants that. And you said to me, Vince, you were like, just, hold it back and trust we're going to see it. Keep it close. And um, it was, I, I still carry that direction with me because like you say, Paul, then that became one of your favorite moments of somebody trying not to cry is so much more uh, enticing than seeing someone just do their trying, crying. There, there's a, uh, uh, a Scottish uh, director who directed uh, the, uh, the uh, famous movie, um, uh, with Burt Lancaster, uh, where they're going to take over a Scottish village for coal, for oil mine, you know, drilling, uh, and everybody is selling their soul. Bill Sheridan, am I got that right? Maybe, um, and 
uh, he meets uh, Burt Lancaster, who comes with an opera of behaviors that he's going to do in the first scene they're going to shoot. And he puts his arm around uh, the director, who's a much smaller man, and says, well, what do you think of all that? And Bill, Bill Forsyth, that's the name. Bill Forsyth looked up at him and said, well, perhaps a wee bit less. <laughs> and that, that to me is generally speaking, the best direction you can ever give to somebody that you're right. Uh, it's, the, it's much easier to take, you know, to, 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 to just let it all out. Yeah. And it's good sometimes to let the actor do that yeah. and get, get, it, get it out of their system. But then, yeah. as you say, it's, it's, it's more inviting. It's more sort of people lean in when they see somebody withholding uh, mm -hmm. a little bit. And, yeah, I'll and never also, forget you. Sorry, uh, um, I, I was just in that moment in, in this story, it is the, it is someone finding strength in the moment when they are most weak and vulnerable. We admire that in people. That's a quality that you admire in people, you know? The, yeah. the people who at their worst are trying to be their best. And we always tried to do that for, you know, the, the characters on the show is find those moments. And, and yeah. again, you, Vince directed it beautifully and perfectly and you executed it, you know, Perfectly. I mean, it was really moving. I did eventually. I think there were quite a few takes where it wasn't as held back. And, you know, you as an actor, you just trust, you get to the end of a day like that and you're like, oh, hopefully they found it somewhere in there. And I think we, we never did too many takes, Elizabeth. We never did a lot of takes. <laughs> it was, it was, no time. Know, you know, Vince, did you notice when Elizabeth cries, her tears don't just come out, they actually, they actually pop they out of her out. eye. You don't need special I, effects. It, it's, uh, it's, it's extraordinary. <laughs> and, and until this moment, I actually didn't realize the, uh, I, I have to say, unfortunate resonance of this with what's going on mm. in this moment. The yeah. idea yeah. that your character was making, a sac was, was making a sacrifice for the greater good, something we'd like everybody to do right now. Uh, you know, and, 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 and the whole idea of not being able to be with loved ones, to be separated by glass at this moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's heavy duty. Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, it's and interesting it, to revisit. Definitely. Um, and what you were saying before, Vince, about it being a big one for lots of other couple relationships as well. We're at the point now with um, May and Colson and May's kind of seeing his star. It's such a, uh, and this goes to you, Paul, of, like it's, it's, there's so many deep, uh, character moments in it of vulnerability I guess and I didn't think about that until you said about you know we've had five episodes on the sixth one maybe you can start to, to have those moments and you've earned those moments of kind of emotional vulnerability from the characters is that something that you kind of thought this is where we're going to put in the main yeah I, for it's sure all thought that right <laughs> uh, uh I you know we've we had a terrific cast. You wanted to give everybody a moment. You wanted to give everybody, if not, a, a, you know, an arc, you know, a story, at least a couple of scenes where there was something there and it could be comedic relief and it could be, you know, real drama and emotional tension, or it could be action. And, and we tried to, you know, sprinkle, we tried to share the wealth as much as we could. And in this episode, you know, we, we did our best to do that. And, um, you know, you it, I see it over on on our side, but um, on my think side this anyway. Was the start of Fitz realizing he was in love with Simmons? Like we just had the moment of the slow pushing of them on the bed, and then we were left with Fitz alone. And you, Vince, you kind of pushed in, and then you, you stayed on him for quite a long time. And then that was the end of the episode. Do you think that right. was this the point where you think? Fitz was like, because he starts this episode flirting with Sky quite a lot. Yeah. And, and he has this very romantic gesture of rushing into the lab. And then we see on that end moment, is this, was this the start of him realizing, do you think? That he was in love with Simmons? Well, it, it, the thing that's charming about this piece is that everybody showed something different from what was expected. A dimension got added to almost every character. 
Mm. So uh, for a young man uh, like Fitz, Sky was this adventurous, gorgeous girl. You were a colleague. We think it's better at the end that he is in love with you. Uh, and that scene, by the way, was played with no coverage at all. We trusted yeah. that you would just do that together in one shot. So we didn't feel the ob obliged uh, to let anybody control it in the edit. We just let you two play it. But May so showed us something in her scene with Coulson that we didn't see very often at all, and certainly probably not at all to that point, uh, a vulnerability and a connection to him. When, when Sky comes out and hugs you, when you're in the uh, conversation yeah. with, with, with Brett, uh, I told her, hug her hard and hug her longer than it's appropriate to hug somebody. <laughs> And the react, the look on your face spoke of what, you know, of, of yeah. that, of, of what happened. So everybody got another dimension. She got deeper. Everybody got deeper and a little outside the box of, of even Brett, where, where, you know, you thought this was going to be just the jock. And it turns out he was smart. He had every one of you figured out. He was not, you know, he had a sense of humor and could take a joke. You know, even though this ends up in a different place with that character, it was a charming change in that moment. Uh, and Clark, of course, was the big daddy. He never stopped being. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say before we jump out, I do want to point out, I thought Clark's performance in the scene oh. with the firefighter with Vince, who played Tony Diaz, uh, I, I thought that was some terrific, terrific work in terms of, you know, when you're saying we're trying to find layers, like the, the quietness of that moment and the softness from Coulson in that moment, showing a different side of himself was um was really terrific i mean clark is i mean you, you know what do you say about clark he but he really crushed that scene and i'll never forget at, at the end of it it was one of the only times that i can recall on the show where when clark was done and vince says go and he walks out of that that firefighter's um kitchen uh and you yelled cut vince the entire crew uh clapped because they just thought Clark's performance and Vince's performance was so terrific. And um, I, I just want to point that out that he did an amazing job in the episode from top to bottom, but that scene is also one of my favorites. Yeah, so well said. And you forget that he can do that stuff too sometimes. Yeah. You know, he's so, Coulson is just the king of the one-liners and you know, the slight raise of the eyebrow and you're just, on the floor laughing but then he can just flip it on you and just absolutely crush your heart in one take is yeah. that um prop behind you is that from that fire station so that that's the fire station yeah the the oh, cool. greg Mel greg melton our production designer and yeah. uh, our art director uh roland rosencrantz were kind enough to save it for me uh, and it's been hanging in my garage since 2013, oh and I God. and I brought it out for the episode because I thought, oh, I have something from from that episode. Oh, I love it. Right. So the episode has finished. I'm going to bring in um, a couple people to ask questions, and then I will let you go. I know your time is so precious. I appreciate you both being here so much. Um, oh, and I did just notice in the chat, Sophia asked if the mice were harmed. No, they weren't. Those mice were so. Hey, oh, absolutely not. Thing. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you remember the rats, Vince? Oh, rats, uh, rats. again, uh, and shout out props to props. Uh, uh, you know, Scott Bauer, two things the rats, because we had fake rats for the, you know, the poof moment, Crazy and enough. for yeah. the Chitari helmet. Uh, he had okay. to fabricate that because they didn't have real helmets for the avengers all of that was cgi scott had to go get this get the you know the 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 footage the um the rights to that property from the marvel film side and fabricate that prop and uh, and he just did an amazing job i thought it looked fantastic yeah he's incredible he was on last week actually talking all things props love scott yeah do man they had that, that little pole that the that they painted that in CGI, but they put the fake rat on the pole and then they were this, <laughs> I think it was George was pushing underneath yes. the tank up. At the moment that Ian and I had to be so serious. Oh my gosh, this didn't work, I'm, I'm gonna die. And then you just saw this little pole coming up and George kind of pushing it, trying to be so quiet. And it was kind of a bit squeaky and 
one of those moments that you go, I'm taking myself far too seriously because there's a man with a stuffed fake teddy bear rat attached to a pole pushing it up. That, that, yep. was, a, that was a great moment. Okay. Again, I repeat, no, no children, old people or animals were hurt. Were hurt. <laughs> yes, and just, uh, exactly. And you are two hours three in this not. episode. Yep. <laughs> so Emma's coming in and uh, she might have a question for one of us. Um, yeah, you. I. That's so funny. You had two out of three of those things in this episode: kids at the start, yeah. and then rats towards the end. Emma, can you hear us? Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. I was just doing the dishes. I wasn't expecting this. Oh, <laughs> what a great task! Do you have a question? Yeah, actually, like, what was the hardest scene to? right in this episode because there were just so many feelings so many feelings and like hard to was... right. <laughs> the hardest yeah, the hard... right great question yeah i want to know this you know i i i honestly they um we do such a thorough job in breaking the actual episode like scene by scene i kind of knew what they were all going to be um, honestly, it may have been the firefighter scene with Colson because there's a tendency, I have a tendency to overwrite. So you take what is like a five page scene and you go, what does this look like if it's a page? And, and you, you, you have to censor yourself and that's, that's really hard. So sometimes you just want to write everything and, and less is often more. Yeah. And trust that you have an actor like Clark Gregg that can act all those in between lines that you took out that's that's a that's takes a lot of trust i guess as a writer to go ah oh. yeah <laughs> and, to, and to create a safe clark created a safe environment for vince when you think about vince who comes in everybody else is going to be on the show tomorrow mm. he had that one moment and clark it was in the script but they're taking out the earwig putting it down it's just you and me now and the focus the two of them had uh, allowed the, uh, a guest on the show to do that kind of work. So uh, it's uh, that's what a good actor can do is to be is so generous with the other player uh, yeah. as long as the words are on the page. Yeah. Thank you so much for your question, Emma. Thank you so much. I really wasn't expecting this. I'm so glad. I'm going to bring on one more person and then um, you can stay on if you want, Emma, or you can go off wherever you want. Uh, I think we have Sean that's going to come in and join. Hi, Sean. Oh my gosh, look at your apron, Emma. Hi, Sean. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I like your t-shirt. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys all so much for doing this. Um, I always um, say I'm the biggest agent of show fan from Hawaii. So thank you. This is like oh the Oh my gosh, I had that on today. <laughs> That was from last year's San Diego Comic Con. Funny. Yes, I love that. Um, I wanted to ask uh, specifically, was there something in season one or a moment that you all recognize that you were on this just amazing, insanely popular show? Um, it, for all of you, if you can think of a moment that you realize that this was something just huge and... Uh... Do you, I think I think Comic Con was the first one for me mm. that were just hearing the roar for Joss Whedon going on stage was just because at that point we'd just been in this bubble and we knew it was a big deal but we didn't really you know you don't have there were no fans at the gates when we drove in there was nothing you know to kind of really gauge if this was going to be if people wanted to see it or not and then that first Comic Con was just nuts i think that's when we went oh my god people are gonna watch this yeah that that video recap of your first comic con was really fun to watch oh good <laughs> do you have one paul because you know being with the show since the very beginning i you know i never felt that <laughs> i never <laughs> had that feeling um you know it at the beginning, you know, we were a target for a lot of like, well, it should be better. And, you know, and then even when, you know, we kind of found our groove, every review always started. We had an inside joke of after a rocky start, S.H.I.E.L.D. seems to be finding, you know, is, is not sucking anymore. And so 
I don't think I've ever felt like the show was a huge hit for me. But then again, that's just me. Again, I'm I was the bitter guy on the staff, so. <laughs> It's probably why it was so good because you never want to think, oh, this is great. We don't have to try, you know. You do the best you can. You put it out there and you hope people like you um, enjoy it. So thank you for saying that. And and thanks for watching and being such a fan. You guys make it all worth it. Thank you. This was so fun. Thank you so much, Vince. Thank you, Paul, for being here. You guys are just masters and really, um, I... I hope I'm. Sh I know this would have come across on this conversation, but these men are the top, top in their field, and I just I'm so grateful for you coming on and sharing your wisdom, and it really makes a difference to people that hopefully could feel like there's a pathway for them to do it too, or just hearing people, hearing the struggle and the the pathway sometimes isn't always an easy one, but it's always going to be worth it, and um, regardless of what you want to do. So thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Thanks for having and, us. Yeah, I knew you. I know you're both just so busy doing lots of very exciting things um, that I can't wait to watch soon. Um, and thank you, Zach, for monitoring the chat all the way from Zach. Indiana. Thanks, and Zach. Wearing the jacket that I always. And make. for those of you out there, don't forget. Very important. Yes. Indeed. Let's do this. Oh, Yes, and thank you to Emma and Sean. I'm gonna let everybody into the Zoom. We're just gonna wave along, and then after a couple of minutes, I'll I'll end it, and you know, probably watch this episode again because I just loved it. Okay, I'm gonna admit all now. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Yeah. Elizabeth Deachin <laughs> said that she wants to be on this. Oh, hi. <laughs> you can Thank you. Oh, hi. Hi. Oh, my God. Hi. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Oh, my God. Thank you. We're doing this every oh, week. Oh, Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Oh, my goodness. Hello. Oh, my God. Hello, Elizabeth. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You guys, I completely forgot. I was meant to announce something and I forgot. We're going to make this into a podcast. So uh, Live with Lil, the podcast. The trailer's up now on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and wherever you get your podcasts. And then each week, we're going to be making these into a podcast. So there'll be um, little exclusive bits as this an intro so and outro amazing. to them. So uh, yeah, go check it out. Tuesday, the trailer yeah. drops. And then we're going to spend a while this week catching up. So there'll be one Ooh. per week. And then next week, we'll be in sync. So it'll be the YouTube Live on Sunday. And then the podcast will come out on Tuesday. My gosh, I'm sorry to mute you all, but I completely forgot <laughs> I was meant to make that announcement today. Um, hey, I love you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.